Good morning, Breakfast Clubbers. My name is Craig Stuart Adams. I'm the president of the Golden Gate Breakfast Club. We have a very special guest with us this morning that's going to be discussing global export businesses. Elizabeth Glenn is a business consultant focused on export strategy and operations. Mm -hmm. She works with manufacturers mm -hmm. to export their products, components, and machinery in global markets. With 25 years of expertise in global transportation and trade, Elizabeth has worked with companies in export operations, trade finance, global logistics, and compliance with the objective of accelerating companies' investments in exporting and maximizing their competitive advantage. Since 1998, Elizabeth has taught courses in global business and operations at various universities and has created customized programs not only for large companies, but for foreign professionals. Elizabeth holds a Master of International Management degree from the famous Thunderbird School of Global Management and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Linguistics and Spanish from the University of California, Irvine. Let's give a warm Golden Gate Breakfast Club applause and welcome to Elizabeth Glenn. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I will just go ahead and share my screen. And what I'd like to share with you is I got carried away with this. My focus is exporting, but what I hope to do is provide you an overview of uh, trade in the state of California. And I think with this group, you're probably, I'm assuming that you're globally focused and very sophisticated, but, I, but in my world, I deal with um, a lot of manufacturers and just to, just to share with you, the, um, in California, we have over 28,000 manufacturers. However, 65% of them are, are under 50 employees. So they don't, they, they don't get a lot of attention. And what's interesting is we are the manufacturing hub of the country, but most people don't realize that. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit of how California is globalized but then also share um, exporting as a path for business growth because I, I spent just about eight, eight years working with a, um, an organization, a nonprofit organization that helped manufacturers. And it's interesting because number one priority is always global business uh, or excuse me, um, continuous improvement. And number two is identifying growth opportunities and believe it or not, they always tell me that exporting, it comes in at nine or 10. I'm here to share that exporting is a, a, is a significant growth opportunity, and I'll explain why that is. So my, my takeaway for you today is, and this group, I'm, I'm sure already you already know this, that the world is open for business. Things have slowed down a bit because of COVID. But um, I've been on a lot of calls and I, I know that Asia, China has been moving forward since mid last year and a lot of Asia has been moving forward. So there is, there is opportunity. And just from the, uh, from the areas that I have been, um, I, I learned that there are, get a load of this, $94 trillion worth of infrastructure projects. A lot of it will be in Asia. But that's, that's between now and 2030, 2035. So that's huge. Also in the aircraft industry, they anticipate the need for 20, about 20,000, actually it's closer to 29,000 new aircraft, again, primarily for Asia and the Latin America market. And then very close to us, California sits on, um, you know, on the Mexican border. And, and it turns out that in the Baja California region, we always think of it as tourism and fishing, but it has over 500 multinationals, which represents $10 billion in supplier needs. And that's right next door. It's amazing because most, most of our companies have no clue that this opportunity exists. And on the Baja side, the, I, the feedback I always get is, is their impression is that the manufacturers don't want to work in Mexico. And that's not true. It's just that they're not aware. And in fact, the state of California is doing, uh, will be doing the first week in May, a uh, virtual trade mission specifically for aerospace and the electronics industry. So that's, that's going to help. How many of you actually look to see where your products are made, that, where they come from? Uh, and, and I bring this because a lot of people don't pay attention. 
for example, kiwis come from New Zealand, right? Avocados, a couple of years ago, you know, we have with the Super Bowl, they always talk about the, you know, the guacamole, we have to have the guacamole. Well, you know, avocados were selling for $5 a piece, which was quite significant because there was a problem uh, bringing them in from Mexico and we had problems here. Are you aware that 98% of all the roses that are sold in this country are basically come from Colombia or Ecuador? It's amazing, okay? And then of course, we're always, our companies are always uh, importing components, parts, machinery, services, all sorts of things. In addition, there's fitness equipment that we use, appliances. I keep hearing colleagues that, that have products stuck on the boats. You've probably heard that the ports of uh, Long Beach and, and um, Los Angeles have had severe backlogs. And I understand it's, it's, under, it's much better now. It's, it went from 40 steam carriers out there to now 18. And a lot of that was impacted by COVID. And of course, wines, they come from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Argentina, and Chile. So those are just a sampling of products that are imported. What we do export are cherries, apples. I know last year, almonds and pistachios actually grew in demand. So that was good. Food products are always a key. Baby formula to China is always um, a critical need. Candies, condiments. There again, we have a lot of sports equipment that, that gets exported, cosmetics, supplements, um, and then machinery components and also services. So we have, there's a lot of import and export, but we predominantly import more than we export. And we need to actually encourage more exporting. How many of you are familiar with this company, BYD? Does anyone, is anyone aware of it? Yes, no? Interesting. I'm going to share two examples of foreign companies that have active operations here in the U.S. and are doing quite well. BYD is, um, they, they are established in Lancaster, uh, Southern California, and they produce uh, electric buses. And here they're the world's largest select selection of ba battery electric buses. But what I want to highlight is that this is a China-based company that established production in, in uh, California, actually. And this is a sampling of their, of their customers. They, they have buses at UCLA. They have the, the largest contract to date was with the city of Los Angeles, Albuquerque. This company, you know, part of the, the reason of being local is so that they can get access to many of these contracts. But what's also interesting is that you know they can leverage the made in in USA label, which for China is pretty significant. But but they're not here because of the because of the lower labor costs. It's because oftentimes we go overseas pursuing the lower labor costs. Labor is just one element of the entire global business entity. So we need to look at what are the other options. But here you have a foreign company that is actually growing significantly. And I, I believe they've been manufacturing for about seven years and they're just really starting to flourish. The next company I wanna share, you're all familiar with BMW. Are you aware that BMW has a manufacturing plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina? Okay, and the facility has actually been there for 25 years. What is interesting is the uh, of course the U.S. is a big SUV market, so uh, BMW decided to have their global platform for SUVs established here in the U.S. market. And as you see, the X3, the X5, and the X7, as well as some of the X4 and X6 models, are produced here. So there again, they're taking advantage of of uh, a large market. But what's also interesting is. Compared to Germany, our, our labor rates are lower, our, we have higher productivity, and then also we have lower energy costs. So here's an opportunity for uh, a foreign-based company to leverage not only the expansion within the US, but believe it or not, they actually export. 70% of what they produce actually gets exported to 125 countries. And what really blew me away was this next thing. For the seventh consecutive year, 
BMW is how was listed as the largest US exporter by value. Okay. The, it, and I knew I learned about this a couple of years ago, but I was shocked in February when I learned that they, they've maintained this for seven consecutive years. And it's not, it's it's not a US company, it's actually a foreign-based company with active operations here. My point being is how do we leverage our manufacturers? to take advantage of the very capabilities that many of these other companies are leveraging and expanding. Now, uh, as a switch, California as a global economy, um, for years, we used to be listed as number five. I noticed this past year, we're now considered among the top 10 economies in the world, if hey, you are a country. Hey. Go ahead. Question? Okay. Um, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, that's and we're one state that in the U.S. But that's the that's the amount of significance that, that the state of California carries. We also host over uh, 90 consulates. We're number three in the U.S. after Washington D.C. and um, uh, New York. The the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach are combined are the largest in the nation, and we have a tremendous about 40% of, of what comes through the ports actually go, moves on through to, uh, to the Eastern part of the US. And geographically, we are strategically positioned between Asia and Latin America, which positions us for, for tremendous growth. Other facts that I've learned is that there are over 10,000 foreign entities with active operations in California. Just to mention Hyundai, you have the Porsche Design Center, um, IKEA, BYD, and I'm sure you could come up with, uh, with a number of others. But, but there again, the, the concern is we always think it's too expensive to do business here or it's too restrictive. Yet there are a lot of companies that are making, they're, they're establishing themselves here because of the access to talent and the opportunities that are available to them. Now, my question to you is, are you aware, and I'm sure this group is aware, um, the US, we make up about 5% of the world's population, which means outside the US lies 95%. Tremendous opportunity for us, but we're a large country. And I think we sometimes we're, we're complacent because we don't realize how much opportunity exists um, across the world. And that's why I'm, trying to get our companies to realize that exporting actually is a growth opportunity. The Made in USA label, absolutely recognized across the world. Even when we have political issues, it's always the demand for, for uh, Made in USA products is, is always high, highly regarded and in tremendous demand. And sometimes companies are willing to pay a slight premium to have the products because they trust it. Food safety is an issue in, in China. So, so the, having reputable quality is very important. Also, made in California companies garner a, a lot of interest. So I always share with business owners if, they're, if they produce here, let them know that that's important because for example, in the Middle East, that almost takes more credibility than the made in USA. So these companies can leverage between the two. Now I mentioned uh, California as a trading partner. Texas is the number one state for exporting. California comes in at number two. These are 2020 numbers, just to give you an idea. In uh, 2020, we exported about $156 billion, which was down from the previous year, but it represents almost 11% of all the manufactured goods that were exported out of the US. What's also interesting and I highlighted is that most products go to a handful or a basket full of countries. In this case, it's the Census Bureau tracks the top 25. That's 90%. So really, uh, we can export to, to 200 countries, but, but most export to a, a basket full of, of uh, com uh, countries. And you'll see that California's number one trading partner is Mexico. Number two comes in at Canada and, and actually they moved uh, up to double digits last year, which, which showed some growth. And then China is number three, but you see it's, it's predominantly Asia and Europe where we do most of our trading. 
And for those, for, for companies, this is just, there are thousands of products that are exported. I've just highlighted key products, apparel, cosmetics. Believe it or not, pet food is a huge export for our companies, sporting goods, uh, food processing, agriculture. Believe it or not, we have something called the World Ag Expo every February in Tulare, California, which is the Central Valley. Over 100,000 people attend that. Foreign buyers wow. come with cash to buy equipment, so it's significant. Chemicals are a huge export. And then, of course, at the bottom, you have miscellaneous manufactured commodities. But keep in mind, also professional services are, are um, always exported. So we have a broad range of capabilities that can be exported. And this is the next few slides I'm gonna talk about how, how exporting benefits our companies. From the company perspective, it helps them to increase production capacity. A lot of companies right now have sluggish uh, manufacturing capacity. Going to foreign markets is one way to build that up. They can diversify the market risk. Anytime you're in a single market and we have a downturn, it's gonna impact us. But if we're working in multiple markets, not all markets are gonna be down at the same time. So that provides opportunity. Um, we do know that over time, companies tend to be more innovative because you're working, you know, the, doing business is a little bit different around the world. So you become more adaptive and that helps us to be more responsive to a changing market environment. And what's key and what they've seen this year is companies that have been exporting actually weather um, downturns much more readily. So that's another reason to export. I always tell manufacturers they're, that they're sitting, they're, they're sitting on gold, their own products. But more importantly, there are only three reasons to export as I've hi highlighted here. Companies are always looking to access new customers. They definitely want to increase sales so they can boost profit. This is the motivation to get the companies to make the investment so that they can grow. And the, the benefit of, of working in the international arena takes a little bit longer to develop the relationships, but those are long-term. Those customers will stick with you. They don't, they don't switch like they do here in the US. Here, the quality is, is standard, so um, we'll move based on price. That's, that's not always the case on, on the global basis. They want the relationship and they want that trust to, to, to last over time. Here's some reasons why I think companies have not been exporting. It's it, key is, is the, the lack of awareness about the sales opportunity. As I said, we sit right near Baja, $10 billion worth of supplier needs and we don't know about it. That's one reason. Some think it's too complicated. It's a little bit more invested, but there's, there's a lot of help. Um, it, it's risky, but I think it's more risky to go out. We do things on an ad hoc basis. We just wing it. You don't want to wing things on a, uh, on a global basis. It, it gets very expensive. And more importantly, you can actually damage your reputation and that of U.S. companies. So uh, that, that's not a, a good practice. I would say for the most part, most companies have no idea how to move forward. Even the companies that are doing some exporting, they just aren't exposed to the resources, the amount of resources that are available to them. And as I said, the motivation is added sales and the ability to diversify their market as well as financial risks. As far as being a successful exporter, the idea is choosing the right products. A lot of our companies export because the foreign buyer finds them and the foreign buyer is actually driving the business. What we want to do is have, is have the company integrate exporting into their business planning so it becomes um, easier and, and they can build out over the long term. So some market research is appropriate. I've, I've worked with companies. I worked with one company that was already exporting to 20 markets and that's fine. But if they get strategic and they focus on the one or two markets that really provide opportunity, that's huge. And this company, the business owner that, that did this, he grew one year, one market to Mexico, 1,200% in sales. That's huge. And that's a small company. So a lot of our companies can benefit. Um, because of the demand of products, a lot of companies, a lot of our companies will sell cash on advance. But there are other options that if they were to utilize them, could, could encourage the foreign buyers to actually purchase more or buy additional products. And then of course, 
delivery, the shipping element. A lot of companies don't like to be involved in it. Even if you're not involved, it's wise to, to have a basic understanding because guess what? When there's a problem, you get pulled into it as we see with all the supply chain issues that are occurring right now. So questions that, that I encourage companies to ask is my product in demand, okay? One of the key ways to, to, to benefit from that is if you're receiving a lot of inquiries uh, via the internet, that's a good indication and, and you can start there. How, uh, so that's how they find buyers. There are also resources that can help them, especially there's something called the US Commercial Service, which is your federal tax dollars doing something really positive because they become the marketing arm for our companies to the world and they can open doors that we as independent players wouldn't be able to do it. I talked about getting paid and then um, the shipping elements. There's a lot of resources. Here are two, two um, uh, web links. Actually, it's the same web link. It's, it's uh, for the US Commercial Service. There, the web link has just been updated. It's trade.gov. You can think of that, uh, that's the web link and the resource for all things export. So what's, what's key there is um, they do 25 industry market reports. So it's a good, I, it's a good way to get a gauge on, on what are the key opportunities out there. And then also, they also do something how to do business in the country, which is always helpful because it gives you some insight into how, how the selling process works how this, what business protocols are, but also it, it will highlight lead um, pros, prospects and sectors. So that's beneficial. The other thing is if the company is new, I encourage them to look at the videos. They have about 20 or 30 videos. They're three to five minutes each and it's high level, but it gives an overview. So for um, companies that are new, it gives them a, it, it gives them a resource of, of how to of what's involved. And then when we connect them with the actual experts, it makes it a little bit easier and the process flows more, more smoothly. So here you have the world, the motivation to export, it's growth. I mean, we're looking for growth. We're, we're looking to build out sales, but as you see, it takes ideas, research, concepts, coordination, networking, um, and all this can be achieved uh, with a little bit of time and commitment. This was the U.S. Commercial Service. These, this is based on their, their last year's um, impact. As I said to you, normally when our economy goes down, then we look at exporting. And it's interesting because what they said last year is that uh, what uh, number of companies realized, those that were exporting realized a 9% increase in sales. That's good. And instead of uh, the average of exporting to one or two, maybe three countries, they actually were expanding to eight. So that's a, a step in the right direction. What I found interesting in this exporter profile is that 65% improved sales in existing markets. These are what we call the, uh, the accidental exporters. These are companies that are exporting on an ad hoc basis. As I said, if you look to see where are we exporting, can we build that out? 65% of these companies that actually looked saw that there was opportunity and that's beneficial. Another, another group actually started looking at, at uh, exporting into new markets. So that's good. And 12% uh, first time exporters. So at least we're going in the right direction. On average, about 5% of our companies, of all our companies actually export, which is interesting because of what, of what Germany produces, about 47% is exported. South Korea of what it produces, about 46% uh, is exported. And in the US, we only export about 18%. So if we could kick that up 10 or 15%, that would not only help the companies significantly, but it would help our companies as well. And what determines success? It's time, resources, and staff. Having at least one individual that's the face of the company. It does take an investment of time, but since things are slow right now, this is a good opportunity to start working, to start learning about the process, start um, understanding what resources are available uh, to them so that they can build a plan and then implement it. Ideal candidates, and this is just 
This is just a guideline. I, I've worked with companies smaller and larger, um, obviously unique products, and it can also be services, professional services, manufacturing services, um, franchising. Those are all exportable elements. Typically, with at least 10 employees, they have to have enough so that they can dedicate the resources to support the exports. And I put nine to $90 million in sales. Typically, companies over 100 million will already have internal resources. But I will share with you, I worked with a two-owner company and a $4 billion defense unit. And I'm here to tell you that it has nothing to do with how large you are or how much cash you have. It's how you play the game. This small company I worked with, um, they made a, the, the growth on their exports. We tripled, we nearly tripled their business in two years just by our ability to play the game and, and uh, you know, be able to deliver the, the program. So it has, it's, if you're small, you can compete. And remember, there's a lot less competition at the global level right now, okay? Some of the roadblocks that we see is that, and key are, are that companies just don't recognize the opportunity. They don't know where to find the resources. They're not sure. They, they don't think that there's a market. That's why I always, when I talk to companies, I like to know what they're doing. And then, you know, they can, we can, we can direct them accordingly and, and help them. And if it's not appropriate, then, then maybe they wait a year or two. That's, that's possible. But, but what's really key is to understand that exporting, they need a strategy, they need a basic plan, and they have to have a process. If they can integrate that into the business planning, that's huge. I worked with a company. Um, it was a manufacturer of scholastic products. The company knew for years that there was, there was tremendous opportunity on the international side, but like most companies, never got around to doing it. Finally sat down, we finally got them to do an export growth plan. And it was interesting because these companies then vet their plans. It was February 28th. The company had, had um, projected a financial export forecast of $450,000. Okay, when he was reviewing that on February 28th, he realized that the company had exceeded that amount the first week in, in February. That's in five weeks, which highlights the fact if that's what a company does on an ad hoc basis, can you imagine if they integrate exporting into their plan, they could grow so much more, okay? And it's a journey. It's a, as, as one of my clients always says, it's a learning journey, but it's, it can be a very lucrative learning journey. As far as resources, it's exporting is, is far more achievable than you think. It's, there are a lot of resources. The US Commercial Service is the marketing arm. Export Import uh, Bank and the SBA Export Trade Finance, they can help you with, with pre-export uh, financing, post-export financing. They can help with foreign credit insurance, local district export councils. And I know you have one in San Francisco. Um, these are councils of professionals who are dedicated, who are available to helping companies advance in their export journey. And then of course, attorneys, banks, um, freight forwarders, consultants, all sorts of resources available. And the Small Business Administration has some international support at their business development centers. So there's a lot of resources. It's just a matter of learning where they are. And my, my uh, point is that you have a lot of questions, we have solutions it, and we can help you as, as we move forward. So I encourage companies. And if you know of companies that, that are thinking about it, encourage them, okay? I, I, I encourage them to grow slowly, but grow and then build out their export infrastructure especially in the beginning. It's really easy in the beginning because they can build out as then they have the process, it's formalized. And then as more and more countries become interested in their products, they can expand. I had one company, he didn't, he, he didn't want to do that. And I checked back with him a year later and um, he was working with one, one country when I worked with him, when I spoke with him. And a year later, it was up to eight countries. And 
he struggled to man the company struggled to manage that. That's why you, they're, they're, it's beneficial to have a an infrastructure there. And then of course, it's an investment. I always it, it is, but we invested in our companies. We invest in our education. We invest in all sorts of of uh, learnings, and that's important. So it's time learning. What I work with companies, I help them to gain a comp their competitive position in the global marketplace because you can be small and be in demand, and that's where I work. And there again, um, they make they they increase their sales, they make fewer mistakes, which increases the profit, and that's uh, it's a it's a win win win. And finally, this is the benefit to the California economy. It's it's. For manufacturers, they're interested in increasing sales and profit and diversifying their market in financial risks. They want to grow. And local economy, they're interested in keeping their manufacturers in the city and also growing jobs. Well, guess what? If the company is growing, it's less likely to move. And also, as they have to expand out their sales, it's going to create jobs. And of course, ser service providers, freight forwarders, bankers, attorneys, all those, as our companies grow, so does our, our support for them. So that's added business opportunity. And the key, the, the key benefit is we have a far more resilient and dynamic economy. We're far more flexible. So I, I share this is a win, 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 win for all of us involved. It's just a matter of realizing it and then connecting the pieces so that these companies can move forward. And of course, now's the time, okay? Let's leverage that made in USA uh, quality and label. The other thing is there are a lot, there's a lot more competition now. There's a lot of foreign competition operating in the US market. So we do need to be more attentive to, to this aspect of globalization because it is important and it does positively impact us. Um, so uh, that's, that's key. Here's my contact information. And I'm happy to, to well, we'll answer questions. And I'll just, I'm happy to answer your questions, hopefully provide some solutions. If I can't answer it or that my network can't, then we'll direct you to people that can. And with that, I'd like to uh, answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. You know, first of all, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, I do have a quick question for you because we've talked about this a number of times, but one, the question I have is, you know, China has been such a dominant player in this whole import business. And yes. I see them getting involved with, you know, our label made in America, made in California, but it's really a Chinese back company. And I'm, I, I'm, I have some problems with that. I, and I just wanted to, maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Is this, is, Correct me if I'm wrong, but is that a good thing? Is it good for us? Or is there something we should be aware of on that front? In, in, okay, there's there's also something the US, like many, many of our emerging countries, economies, they have invested in what they call foreign direct investment. And we have something called Select USA, where we're actually encouraging foreign entities to invest or set up operations here, because guess what? It creates jobs, okay? So um, now for, for and, and they will look at it positively because they're, create, they're providing jobs. Now, how quickly those jobs get provided, it's a different story because I, I know a couple of years ago, uh, Foxconn was supposed to set up a, a, a factory, I think in Wisconsin. And as far as I know, that's never been developed. There was a commitment but it hasn't, it hasn't moved forward. Uh, the motivation for China is they wanna be perceived as a local player. They, they want to leverage that because 50 states you know, with, with bus needs, it's interesting. Now BYD also has an automobile when they first came to, to uh, the US, they actually have um, a building in downtown Los Angeles that has never, never materialized. So the automobile element has not moved forward, but the bus has. And, and so it, it does create jobs. I do know that they did have some problems in the beginning, but see also being in California, they have to, they have to comply with all the regulations. So it actually requires the, the China entity 
to comply with with California standards. So in that aspect, it's 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 positive for them. And, but and also think about it, they can leverage the made in the made in USA label because it is made here, and that care for China that carries a lot of clout. All right, thank you, uh, Pete. I see. I, I don't know how up. other people. Do. Yes, Pete. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, I just uh, want to comment on uh, BYD uh, that has made quite okay. an uh, impression. Uh, impact here in the United States. Um, but most transit buses in this country are financed with a combination of federal and local money. 80% of the money comes from the feds. 20% has to be raised locally. And typically, and, and we've received uh, bids from BYD, um, but BYD is usually the low bidder. And um, in my agency, we, we do not do uh, requests for bid. We do requests for proposal. Um, we write the spec and you need to meet our spec before we'll buy your equipment. Our electric buses are built by Proterra. Also here in California, Proterra's headquarters is in Burlingame. So it is like a total American company all the way. Um, uh, BYD mm -hmm. have gone for the business, but um, you mentioned Albuquerque as one of your, uh, one of their, um, uh, areas where they sold buses. Yeah. Albuquerque bought BYD yeah. to run a, uh, a BRT, bus rapid transit line. And with a lot of fanfare, they rolled it out and the buses could not perform. They ended up returning all of them to BYD. The buses now are really? flyers built in Canada. Canadian buses now run that. And part of the agreement with BYD and Albuquerque uh, was that, well, we'll take the buses back and we'll give you your money back, but you can't tell anyone why we, uh, we did this deal to take them back, but it was, they could not, okay. they could not meet the standard. So, you know, not well, to. And, and to your point, that's that, but that's a, that's a, that's, that's a valid, that's a valid point. That's, we have to see based on our needs, and the quality and whatnot, all of that we have to we have to evaluate. Now I do know that that recently they signed um, a contract with the city of Los Angeles for 130 buses, and I uh -huh. understand that's one of the largest. I don't know if that's if that's actually rolled out. And you're you're right. Sometimes you know the other thing is uh, uh, China funds you know supports their their companies where here we we have to be competitive or we can't mm -hmm. play right yeah so so all those elements come into play but that's i didn't know about albuquerque that's interesting yeah and i also find that the purchase by uh, la metro to be interesting because la metro bought uh, initially a dozen byds and and they also had problems they they've since returned them to byd uh, and I'm sure they've gotten some credit uh, against the new order, but you know, a, a transit bus in America has to last at least 12 years or run a half a million miles. Um, and you know, when you're turning it back after less than two years, I mean, that's not good. Well, and that's that's going to hurt. That's that's going to hurt BYD as as well. I mean, because if they can't deliver, and they and they do that with with multiple contracts, mm -hmm. then that's going to tarnish the reputation. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not uh, averse. I mean, you know, we also buy, we have buses built in Canada. Um, so we're not averse to buying from outside the United States if that's who will meet our spec. And uh, so, you know, we've done that, but uh, uh, the, the BYD product has just been problematical for a lot of the, a lot of agencies. Well, and they haven't been here all that long, right? I, I think they've only been manufacturing six or seven years. So I don't know how long it takes to get all the kinks out. I know BMW has been here for 25 years. Yeah. You know, but it's also a different, it's you know, a different level of, of product too. Right. Yeah. The first BYD buses that came to the United States were built in China. So they, they sent prototype buses from China first. Then they opened the Lancaster plant and, and now everything comes from Lancaster. Okay. Well, but and that, that the fact that that they can sell that they produce it here does allow them to to say that it's produced here. Oh yeah. Which yeah. that yeah. Yeah, globally that that benefits them. Uh, Mr. President, thank you for sharing you, that. That's interesting. Lincoln. 
Yes. Um, yes, Patricia. Uh, yes, if uh, Betty, uh, Elizabeth, wonderful presentation. May I ask you to stop sharing your screen so it is easier to see oh, who has their yes. hand up? And Richard Wang Thank you. has anxiously been requesting a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. All right. Elizabeth, excellent talk. Thank you. For clarification, did I hear you correctly? BMW is the largest dollar exporter from the United States, surpassing Boeing and Apple? No, 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 no. They're the largest auto exporter by value. Auto. auto in, in, their, in their sector. Thank and you. I share that because I'm thinking we need to have one of our companies be the largest auto player. Now, now, having said that, I know that they were exporting, I read recently, like within the last week or two, that also BMW is now looking to produce in China. And, and that's, you know, depending on how large these markets are, it does make sense for them to establish local operations. But part of what I read is part of the motivation now is because of the increased tariffs. And that tariff, I guess, puts them at a, at, a, at a price disadvantage. So now they're actually looking to produce in China. And then I wonder, well, do, how is that going to impact the operation here? And, it, and I will tell you, the, the BMW plant, it, it uh, employs over 11,000 people. So it's, it's significant. Uh, e Elizabeth. Uh, this has been really, it's so wonderful to hear an expert who is articulate. I was uh, surprised we have 90 consulates in California. Which ones would surprise us most to know they're here? I was talking, I'm, I'm helping a, an entity do a, a grant proposal and, and it's international. He said, no, but it's a chamber. It's not a consulate. I'm not sure. There's, there's the Philippines almost, I, I'm trying to think, he said Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, of course. Actually, interesting, the largest concentration of people from Iran outside or outside of Iran is Los Angeles. The largest concentration of Thais outside of Thailand is Thailand, or is, is here. It's, it's amazing how many you know, ethnic groups we have here, and it's it's quite diverse. But we have, um, I've met, um, I'm trying to think, there, there have some small countries that are based here. And also, if you're interested, uh, World Trade Week is, um, it was actually established in Los Angeles in 1927. And it was, uh, now it's a national uh, recognition established by uh, Roosevelt in 1935. But on May 6th, if you look at worldtradeweek.com, there will be a, a program. And because this year we're doing it virtually, I think it's $25 or $35 to participate. But tip, and it's the 95th year that they're, that they're doing it. But it'll talk about, this year they're going to talk about um, some of the, uh, I think some of the energy, the, the energy focus of the ports and some of the technologies and, and some more of the supply chain, but that's a good resource. And you may have something similar in San Francisco, but that worldtradeweek.com, that's, that is, that's uh, really beneficial. And I, I'm just trying to, there are a lot of small countries I've met. I, I was actually talking, I got introduced to, he was the consul general of somewhere in the middle East and, um, we, it was something to do with construction. And I was telling him that we had a manufacturer, it's a woman owned business and she does architectural glass. And in, uh, in Kuwait, the largest hospital in Kuwait has 5,000 of her architectural glass panels surrounding the hospital. It's called ultra glass with one S. Look at their featured projects. And that's a, another small company. It took her a couple of years. It was it was hard, but I was talking to the council general, and I said I happened to say that oh, there we have a manufacturer here that does that's done something in Kuwait. He knew about that. He already knew about it. So they do talk, you know, regionally and and locally. They do talk. 
Uh, Tana Hope. Um, great presentation, wonderful resources. Uh, when I was working for U.S. Embassy in Seoul, Korea, my job was helping U.S. companies to export into Korea. I worked for, okay. yeah, I worked for the customs department, but also worked, worked closely with the U.S. Commercial Service, U.S. Trade Center, and U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Seoul, Korea. And most uh, large countries and cities uh, would have the service that U.S. Commercial Service has a well, foreign commercial service branch. So if you are looking into export to whatever the country, uh, this is a free resources for you as a taxpayer. So contact U.S. Embassy and if they have uh, those uh, foreign commercial service or U.S. Trade Center or U.S. Customs uh, uh, resource available. And if even if it's not available, they will have um, connections to available resources in Korea or in Japan or wherever, they will know what to do. Most services are free. Uh, some very specific services are uh, fee-based, but very small fee. But the amount of benefit that you get by contacting US, go US government, US embassy basically, uh, and the leverage that you can get using those free services will be uh, very good. Um, so I, I highly encourage you use available uh, free resources to uh, your taxpayer contact the US, uh, US embassy in the country that you are targeting to export and you will be very happy. Just wanted to well, tell and you thank you. Work hard. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that because it is important. The way it works that we have, wherever we have embassies around the world, um, at least 70 of them have what they call commercial trade offices and they have, they have local experts and their sole purpose is to help connect our, our companies into local opportunities. Now it doesn't work with the 90 consulates here they're all focused on, on representing their companies to expand here in the US. But to your point, it's a great resource. And another example of, of how to use the commercial service, let's say uh, you, you come across a buyer uh, in the Middle East, actually with, this, with uh, a company, she said, oh, they, they used all the right terminology. It sounded like it was a good option. And what I suggest is contact the local US commercial service because they have their counterparts in all these countries, as you say, in South Korea and wherever, and they can vet, they can, they can vet the company to make sure that it exists and it's financially viable. And oftentimes they'll do it at no cost. And to your point, if there's a cost, it's just to recoup the local, the local cost. So it doesn't, it's not like a private entity where there's, where there's uh, overhead involved. So that's, that's, Thank you. That's a very important point. Yeah. And uh, another advantage is if the country that you are trying to export to speaks different languages, they do have a, a you know, language service available uh, who can help you in pretty good details. Uh, they can help you legally, uh, uh, well, legally, <laughs> meaning they can they can, you, if you ask certain questions that involves laws, they cannot work as your attorney, but they can give you some available Guidance. free advices. So yeah, leverage the US resources well, overseas. And you bring up a good point because a lot of times they'll say, well, companies, it, you know, they, they wanna go in and establish operations in another country well, or, or we wanna sell direct. I mean the benefit of having a local partner is we're outsiders to that culture. So we don't, and it, and it, it's interesting because I've learned in business, you know, we're, we're very contractually oriented, you know, overseas, a lot of it, it, you will have a contract, but it's based on the relationship, but it's also knowing how business is done in that marketplace. And that's huge. And sometimes we get into, we get into real problems because we do things that are appropriate here, but inappropriate somewhere else. Or the, the classic example, 
I don't know. It's probably not as prevalent today. But but uh, when they were talking about U.S. American or uh, Japanese American teams, you know, negotiating, the Japanese strategy would be just to go silent. That, and that was a strategy, an effective strategy that they used because we don't like silence and we start talking and they actually have team members that are paying attention. And that's a good way to, to uh, get more information about the company. And in Japan, I understand you can't, you can't access the internal workings of a company. You, you go into a, a, a neutral area, which that's how they protect their, their IP and their trademarks and, and all that as well. And as our members might remember, when Derek Arden was talking about negotiations and they went to France and they had one of their team who could speak French and the, the, their teams didn't realize that. And just for roll call, uh, Thomas Kowalski and Janice Litvin did come in. And Janice, did you have a question or comment for Elizabeth? Uh, not, I'm not very well educated on um, international exports, but I was fascinated. And I, kept, I kept saying to myself during the presentation, this is something I should pay more attention to. So I was just very fascinated. Thank you so much. Good. And well, if, sorry, Tana, if you want to make another comment, I was just going to put on notice uh, just because Michael Sarah is the only one in our screens that I can see that actively does business between Japan and America. If you had any comment or question you would like to pose, Michael. Thanks, Patricia. <laughs> no, what, what Elizabeth said about the Japanese in terms of negotiation is uh, spot on because uh, I always tell them just listen because the first person who speaks yeah. next is going to lose. So you're spot on on that. And Michael, I really enjoyed your presentation a couple oh, of ago. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, as we have some loyal members from Ohio and Texas, I don't know if you have any comments comparing their trade to California. Well, we just, I just read a, uh, an article this morning um, that said that Texas's exports fell rather dramatically. Uh, they're still the leading exporter, but that's basically because of energy. Uh, that's, that's what gets uh, exported most, uh, energy and, and probably BS, but um, we can't measure that. So um, yeah, very, very good presentation, Elizabeth fascinating um thank, fascinating thank you well and california exports i saw were down it's a, it's about 11 percent. but still this is the time to be building and what's amazing is knowing that asia that that there are several economies in asia they're moving forward so and also i don't know i, I bet most of you don't realize on November 15th, there was a, the, it's now considered the world's largest trade, free trade agreement. It's the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Extension Partnership, and China is a part of it, along with Australia, New Zealand, and I think it's a total of 14 countries. But that, should, that needs to be a wake-up call for us, because it's the first time that China is actively involved in a trade agreement, and that gives them leverage. And, and my concern is we need to move forward or we're going to lose out to competition. It's not lack of capability, it's complacency. We're not paying attention. What and is the Randall, RCEP uh, again? Regional Comprehensive Extension Partnership. And I, and I never heard anything. I just happened to see it twice. And that, boy, in the U.S., it really, they kept, well, because it wasn't important, but it is important. Strategically, it is important. Because NAFTA, now the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, that's traditionally been the, the largest and it's also the most successful. That's why you have the European Union. That's why you have all these trade partnerships because it's been so, so successful. Now, there are problems with it. I mean, it, it, you know, the NAFTA needed to be upgraded and still needs to be upgraded. But, but that, that pooling of resources 
and and I know a couple of years ago the NAFTA the I was in San Diego and there was a a, a Canada Trade Commissioner there was a representative from from Baja California and Mexico and the I guess when Obama just before he he left the three presidents had met and they were talking about taking NAFTA global I mean that's really powerful and and I remember that Enrique said. He says, I know the U.S., you're not quite ready. When you're ready, you come join us. But Canada and Mexico, we're moving forward. They can't afford not to. Uh, Randall Reader, Reader, then Tim Durkin again, then Janice Litvin. <laughs> right. Then Betty. Uh, following up on <laughs> Tim's point about <clears throat> a lot of energy being exported from Texas, uh, here, the Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, tri-state region, I think is the third largest natural gas producers in the world. Uh, wow. So we've got an abundance of natural gas, especially from shale. And a friend of mine is working with a company <clears throat> uh, called uh, the Shale Crescent that is trying to get more manufacturers to come into this region to produce various products, whether they're using natural gas as the, uh, as the base product or using it for energy, uh, especially making plastics. Uh, so of course, we've got a big market here in the Eastern part of the US. There a tremendous number of customers uh, within 500 miles, for example, of uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and the export market from here should be pretty good also. But, possibility of it uh, for products that would be produced here because of the low cost of, uh, of the natural gas. And Ohio is a, is a pretty, it's one of the dominant exporting states. There are about 10 or 11 states that have been very aggressive and they have overseas offices. Believe it or not, California has one and it's in China. We used to have multiple and now we have it's limited and that's something that needs to expand. Elizabeth, my question is, do, can you give us a status of the trade war with China that was started with the previous administration? Because we have a, a local General Motors plant that shut down because of no chips. And I don't know whether it was COVID or trade war or a combination. I've heard that, and I'm not real familiar with it, but I heard that there is an issue with the, with the chips. I don't know if it's a shortage. And I do know along, I'm not sure on the chips portion, but I know the rare earth minerals that are utilized in electronics. Apparently from what I understand, most of that or much of that comes from China and China has started to restrict it because they're, they're, they wanna protect it for the whole market. And that might be what's going on, but that's, yeah, the chips issue is, is that's a concern. So if you, if you guys want a quick, so the, most of the semiconductor, semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. The biggest manufacturer in the world is TSMC. They're about 60 to 70% of the market. The next one is Samsung in South Korea. So those are the two major sources of semiconductor manufacturing. The interesting point, though, is, as Tim, you mentioned, the trade wars. That's why Taiwan is such a gem. Everybody is very, very cautious of what's happening there, because depending on where that swings, it could really change the economics. The other thing to note, though, is all the manufacturing equipment. So the applied materials folks, LAM research, that's all U.S. based. So there is a trade embargo going on so that the new technology does not go to China. But... It's just a matter of time. Thank you. The last question from Janice Litvin. Oh, okay, thank you. So um, in the 80s, I had a cousin here in San Francisco who was the consul general from the state of Israel. And at that time I learned a lot about the technology happening in Israel and the relationships that Israel has all over the world. Uh, including and especially in regard to technology, not just software, but all kinds of innovations are coming out of Israel. And I'm just wondering what um, information you have about that. What I've, uh, smaller economies tend to be there, 
because they're limited. I mean, in some aspects, the U.S. we're such a big, you know, big space, and we have a lot of resources here. We take we're we're complacent and take it for granted. A lot of these smaller economies, they don't have that, and they don't take it for granted, and they leverage. And I know Israel is really sophisticated, but as is Germany, as is South Korea. But it's it's because and think and that's why I shared what they export. Because if, if, if Germany just focused within Germany or Israel within Israel, they, they wouldn't be the dominant players that they are in the world today. Right. It's because they're leveraging their capabilities and partnering with, with key resources. So that it, there again, it's a win-win. It's gotta be mutual benefit. Right, thank you. And Elizabeth, thank you very much for being so generous with your, your time and your knowledge, as you can see by the amount of people who are still with us. Thank we you. loved your message. And I will now stop the recording. You can see everyone is applauding and cheering for you.